All right, apparently we're live already. Um, well, welcome to another ACE Spotlight session, everybody. Uh, this is Asan here, your host. Um, I'm, uh, I'm honored uh, to have uh, Charles Martin today with us. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, the paper Implicit Separation in Deep Neural Networks, uh, Evidence from Random Matrix Theory and Impl Implications for Learning. Um, uh, Dr. Mar Dr. Martin um, uh, founded uh, the company called uh, Calculation Consulting. Um, um, and uh, I'm just very happy to have him with us. Uh, please uh, feel free to tell us more a little bit about the company um, and we'll be more than happy to hear the talk. Well, great, thanks for having me. Uh, Calculation Consulting is a boutique consultancy in San Francisco, California, and we help clients develop machine learning and AI solutions. So we essentially work with you and your staff as if we're one of you, but we're on the outside and we specialize in things like natural language processing, search relevance, um, quantitative finance, and in the areas where you have sort of modern areas of implementation uh, across the entire stack from both developing strategy and doing research on the, to getting the products into production. And I'm happy to be here today to talk about some work I've been doing with, uh, so this, uh, this is a talk I gave to the Stanford Engineering Department for the GoLab lecture uh, last April. And um, this is a little bit about me. Um, I've been working in Silicon Valley for over 15 years. I worked at Aardvark, which was acquired by Google in 2010, where we developed some of the first machine learning algorithms for natural language processing and search relevance. I was a subject matter expert at eBay in search relevance. I helped work with Demand Media, which was the first billion dollar IPO since Google. And since then, I've been doing consulting work with companies like BlackRock, Roche, France Telecom, um, private equity organizations like Griffin Advisors. And we also do some work in alternative energy and uh, consulting and trying to sort of help with climate change, working with the Anthropocene Institute, which is funded by the Page family. This work is in collaboration with Michael Mahoney, who is at UC Berkeley in the Department of Statistics at ICSI, uh, which is the International Center for um, uh, Software. Um, sorry, I don't remember the acronym exactly. In the Rice Lab, you may be familiar with the Rice Lab because they invented um, Spark, which is the basis of the DataWorks product. So Michael's a specialist in uh, randomized linear algebra and a lot of the theory of machine learning. And he and I both have backgrounds in computational chemical physics and have been friends for a long time. And a few years ago, uh, I think we met at MLConf and we got this, we were talking about why deep learning works and decided that really we wanted to take a look at this from uh, the perspective of theoretical physics and theoretical chemistry, because we have a lot of knowledge about how these kinds of models work in that context. And we think we could say something fairly important about why deep learning works uh, today. Um, so this, uh, and I should point out, I did research. I was a postdoc at the University of Illinois uh, where I did research in statistical mechanics of neural networks and other types of areas in uh, computational neuroscience back in the 90s. So I was doing a lot of this work prior to the, what's sometimes called the AI winter. And so it's really a lot of fun to just come back and start working in this field again. So today's talk is uh, based on a, a series of papers we've written. The first one is this implicit self-regularization of deep neural networks, evidence from random matrix trait implications for learning. And this is a 50, 60 page paper on the archive, which is currently in press. Uh, we have a shorter version, which we submitted to and presented at ICML, which is sort of a 10 page version, traditional and heavy tailed self-regularization of neural network models. Um, a lot of the theoretical foundation of this work starts off as statistical mechanics. So we have an older paper on rethinking generalization, requires revisiting old ideas, statistical mechanics approaches, and complex learning behavior, which is, um, I think has been submitted to JMLR and is also in the archive. And we have um, some of the more recent work, which is based on being able to predict trends and test accuracies for very large pre-trained neural networks. And this was presented to ICML. Uh, in the theoretical physics workshop. And we've been working on trying to get this work published. And we have a number of other things in the pipeline as well. So a lot of the 
research began with Michael and I thinking about this paper that came out in 2017 at ICLR, which was the best paper on what is regularization of deep neural network. And sort of what the paper suggested is that very large models tend to overfit on data where the data is randomly labeled. And when you try to fix this using regularization, you can't seem to fix it. And this apparently was very surprising to a lot of people working in the field. And this prompted a lot of research suggesting that understanding deep learning really requires rethinking what generalization is. And um, for me, you know, I sort of saw this paper with Michael and I said, well, this is obvious what's going on. Um, this doesn't surprise me at all. In fact, it's totally predicted. And I think this is a bit of a, a, bit of a controversial statement. But this is something we know from statistical mechanics. Uh, and so the theory of statistical mechanics totally explains what's going on and predicts this and the stuff we did in the 90s. And the point is that what's the context here? Imagine that you have some data set and you and you've trained the neural network on it, it's a very large data set, and you take say 10% of the label of the labels and, and you call that in and you randomize them. Uh, so if you randomize those, so this little picture shows sort of each of these little red, you imagine that little rectangle here is the um, is your label set, and each of these red slashes represents some of the random labels. Well, you could think of this as now taking the problem which existed, one problem with very, very good labels and turning this into two to the n problems with bad labels. And so what you end up with are two to the n, imagine two to the n overtrained solutions. And what this would look like, imagine if you had two to the n solutions which were all overtrained. Locally, they would all look convex. You know, you would solve the problem, it looks like you solved it. You would look at the energy landscape, the energy landscape would look locally convex and you wouldn't need to do anything. However, each of the solutions would be separated from themselves with very, very high energy barriers. So there'd be no way to generalize. So in other words, if I have, if I'm in this, if this solution here, and this is this dimension is basically the weight matrix, or you might think of it as the um, the examples, and I make a small change to one of the input data points, the energy goes way up. So you're basically get trapped in this system which is pathologically non-convex. It locally it looks convex. Yet it has an almost an infinite number, or two to the n number, of um, degenerate local minima. So in physics, this is called a spin glass phase. This is the spin glass phase in physics, and this is predicted uh, using what's called the statistical mechanics theory of generalization. And so we have a paper where we go through a lot of the pedagogy of explaining where this comes from. From our point of view, looking at sort of the modern approach to this, you know, going um, um, trying to understand what Yes. Chart. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Um, your your uh, your head is out of the screen. Uh, could oh, you I'm mind? sorry. I stood up. I didn't realize we're actually. Got it. Got it. <laughs> no worries. Uh, Try you, again. You could, Try again. Yeah, you could either step back a little bit if you want to stand up. That's perfect. No, fine. we're all good. <laughs> so let's let's talk about um, what what is in a modern context. What is regularization? So we ask ourselves. Well, if we have to rethink what regularization is. Why don't we try to figure out what people mean by it? And it turns out that every knob and switch in deep learning is called regularization. If you do dropout, that's called regularization. If you uh, make the batch size smaller, that's called regularization. If you add noise to the data, that's called regularization. In fact, there's a little paper we point out where there are probably 50 different things that's called regularization. So the first thing you need to do, if you're going to understand what regularization is, is you got to at least define it, you know, figure out what we're talking about. So let's go back to you know the 1950s, um, ridge regression or uh, taken off Phillips regularization. So we you know right, this is stuff that was invented uh, in, in the electrical engineering um, field by a guy named uh, Phillips. Um, and the idea is that if you are trying to solve some linear system, W x equals y. Typically, the solution of this is to form what's called the Moore Penrose pseudo inverse. So you take x, which is w transpose w. And you form the inverse of this, and you and what you do is you add a little um, term to the dot. You add a uh, term to the diagonal, which is a regularizer, and this now gives you a solution: x x hat plus alpha i inverse times w transpose y is the actual solution. And this is the classic form of regularization. So then you 
you know, you give it a Russian name, you call it taken off regularization, it sounds very fancy. And there's a whole field of research around this. But the, this this then leads to what a, this then leads to what is a very familiar optimization problem. This sort of linear algebra solution becomes this optimization problem where you minimize this L2 loss, Wx minus y squared, plus some alpha times the norm of W, which is probably more the more familiar optimization problem we see in machine learning and deep learning. So the essence of this is that we soften the rank of X. We can think of X as being a full rank matrix. And if X had zero, some zero eigenvalues in it, you could not invert it. This inverting W transpose W or inverting X would be impossible. It would have a zero determinant. So the idea, original idea is, well, we'll just add a little term to the diagonal. So when we make the inverse of X, yeah, we can invert it. And, and you can think of this as saying we're going to soft, but even, even in cases when X is full rank and it does not have zero eigenvalues, some of the eigenvalues might be very small. And you can think of softening the rank of X because we're going to focus on all the eigenvalues of X where E, or, where e is greater than alpha, the regularization constant. So this is the classic understanding of what is regularization. So let's put this in the context of deep learning. We have, let's just call, let's set up the problem as the energy landscape. We, we're going to define the energy landscape of a neural network as um, a problem where you have some data, you feed the data into the network, and you get some outputs. And here, um, these weights are hidden. You think of the weights and biases, and there's usually some activation function H uh, that you apply to the weight. So you have... Um, Basically, uh, this is the form of the energy landscape. And by the energy landscape, we mean this function, which depends only on the weights and biases and not necessarily on, you know, the, the, you know, the batch size or the learning rate or other details of the optimizer. So this defines a, a simple function of H and B, of biases. And we imagine that we, when we solve deep learning, we want to minimize some loss function where we subtract this energy function minus the label. So typically this is, you know, like uh, cross entropy or something like this. And so the question is, how do you avoid overtraining? So this is a, a serious problem. People generally thought that this is some sort of very nasty, non-convex optimization problem, and you have to do something very, it's very, very difficult to understand how to avoid overtraining. So what do we want to do here? We, we notice that the energy landscape is completely defined by the layer weight matrices and the biases. So I'm just, I'm going to forget about the biases right now. I just assume that's part of the layer matrix. So we re, the energy landscape is determined by the layer weight matrix. So we want to characterize the learning process by studying the weight matrices themselves. Then, and, and to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the eigenvalues of this correlation matrix, 1 over n, w transpose w for each layer. So just like in traditional normal regularization where you form the, the more Penrose pseudo inverse, we're going to form this correlation matrix X, and we're going to look at its eigenvalues. And we're going to study how these eigenvalues evolve during the learning process to try to figure out what regularization is. So it turns out that you can do this by looking at, by using something called random matrix theory. Random matrix theory is a lens that we can use to look at the weight matrices of a deep neural network and try to understand its convergence properties. Now, typically up till now, this has been used, for example, by the group at Google to look at things like the Hessian. Uh, but we would argue when you look at the Hessian, and that, that's a useful thing to do, the Hessian gives you very local information. We're interested in looking at global information. So an example of this um, is in latent semantic analysis. Many people uh, may be familiar with LSA. It's a standard technique we use to build clusters of documents. And the standard is, so I'm just going to give you an example of what we mean of this context within something that people do all the time in industry. So I form a TF-IDF matrix over a bunch of documents, and I want to build some clusters. So I, I form what's called the singular value decomposition of this matrix, which is U times some, times some uh, diagonal matrix times another matrix V. And then you do something like you go into scikit-learn, and you use truncated SVD, and maybe you keep, you keep the top k equals 400 singular values, and you get something called the truncated SVD matrix. And then you use this to cluster your documents. This is called LSA. Now, what I'm going to argue is that LSA is a soft rank approximation of this original term document matrix. 
So the idea is equivalently, instead of forming the SVD of A, mathematically, we would form the correlation matrix and we compute the empirical spectral density, which is basically some a histogram of the eigenvalues. And so we use this little delta, a sum of delta functions that mean every time there's an eigenvalue, we get a little spike, we count them. The singular values of A are the square, the square of the singular values are the, are the eigenvalues of lambda. And if we were to plot a histogram of the eigenvalues in LSA, and this is an actual plot from some data, you might find that the eigenvalues sort of have this heavy tailed like behavior. If we plot all the eigenvalues in blue, they, they go all the way up the, for, a, the, for this matrix, they'll go all the way up to, um, uh, uh, you know, four or 500 of them are, are very small. And as you shrink down for a very, very large matrix, as you shrink down, you start seeing this, uh, the tail approaches in this case around 50, uh, a maximum eigenvalue around 15 or 20. Uh, actually, excuse me, 35, the maximum is out here. So what you see is this bulk region of eigenvalues where most of where we're going to throw away this bulk and we see this sort of heavy tail of eigenvalues that comes up but the heavy tail is truncated it's a truncated heavy tail so if we were to fit this spectral density to a power law in this case the power law exponent is around 4.75 there's a package a python package called power law where you can do this and what you would find is that there are these spikes that arise outside of this bulk region. And when we do truncated SVD, what we do is we just sort of keep this region right here that's red and we throw away this blue region. So we do this all the time in machine learning. It's a very, very basic algorithm. LSA was invented in Chicago uh, back when I was a grad student in 1990. Very old algorithm, still very useful. So now I wanna do the same thing, but I wanna look at the spectral density of the weight matrices of a deep neural network. And in this case, what we're going to look at is we're going to look at just some toy MLP. We take a three-layer MLP, we train it on CIFAR-10, and we look at the spectral density. And what do we find? Okay, we find something very similar. If you look at the singular values, you get this nice bulk region in blue, which is this um, uh, semicircle law. If you look at the singular values, if you look at the eigenvalues, you sort of get a plot that in blue that looks like this. Um, Go to tail, but it cuts off at around three. Um, the reason you, by the way, you look at the singular values here is because these are, are using a Q equals one. Q is the aspect ratio in over in. So this is a square matrix. So when you have, and it turns out when you start, when you initialize the matrix in red, when you're in red, we usually initialize a deep neural network using you know, glow rot normalization and or Xavier, you know, glow rot normalized normalization. So you start off with a truncated random matrix. And during training, these spikes start to, at the end of training, you start getting these spikes. And what we're going to claim is these spikes can carry most of the information of your neural network in your weight matrix. So the way the information you're learning is appearing in these spikes and this sort of bulk region well, I mean, it still has some information. If you were to throw it away, you, your accuracy would not be great. But most of the information is contained in the spikes, 95% of the information. So this is very easy to do um, yourself. All you have to do is, you know, in this case, you know, if you have a model, say so you have some pre-trained model, you import Keras, you get, the, you get the weight matrix, you get N over M, which is the shape. Q is N over M. You compute the dot product, which we saw before this correlation matrix. You get the eigenvalues. You can use it. You can either get the eigenvalues of X or you can do singular value decomposition of W. I usually do SVD on W, but this is the same idea. And then you plot a histogram. That's all we're doing. Not very complicated. These are not very large weight matrices. It's fairly simple. Now, what's interesting is that in the spikes aren't the whole story. So in small old neural networks, what you see is you start off in training and imagine you're, 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 you have these sort of random matrix that you start off, you initialize. And so the initial weight matrices we choose when we choose a Gaussian random matrix ends up being looking like this. And this red line corresponds to a fit from random matrix theory called the marchinko pasteur fit. As you in, as you start training more, in this case, we're doing something even more interesting. We're going to take a model and we're going to start with a very large batch size of 500. 
And we're gonna slowly, we're gonna retrain the model over and over and over, but we're gonna decrease the batch size from 500 to 250 to 100, all the way down to two. So we're effectively inducing regularization through a phenomenon called the generalization gap phenomenon. There's this very funny phenomenon that exists in neural networks that when you when you shrink the batch size, you get better results. You generalize better. And it's not entirely clear why this happens. But this is a very interesting way that allows us to induce a very strong form of regularization without changing any of the details of the neural network. We don't impose L1 or L2 or dropout. We have the exact same architecture and we're inducing regularization by changing the batch size. And what you find is that the training actually induces a breakdown of this Gaussian random structure. And when you start getting to very high accuracy, you get what's called heavy-tailed self-regularization. So it appears that what, what's going on is the random matrix starts to break down, you start getting spikes, the spikes start to pull away from the bulk. And in all small neural networks, this is what's going on. This is like in the 1990s, this is what you would see. Mm. Mm. Then this is but in the in the larger neural networks, what we find is that the, the phenomena is much more pronounced. And the, mm. the this region, you start to get this edge that pulls out, and then you get this tail, and pretty soon it's all tail. It basically the whole system becomes spikes and the fits are really, really bad. And so this is the essence of the theory, this very interesting phenomenon that as you add more and more regularization you appear to pick up more and more correlations in the data and you move from what looks like a random matrix or a bulk plus spike to this heavy tail phenomenon. Uh, and, Charles, uh, could you yes. reiterate, uh, because the, um, the graphs may be uh, a little bit small, uh, what the X and Y axis were again? Uh, uh, this is a histogram. So this is basically the value of the eigenvalue and this is the number, the number of eigenvalues. Gotcha. So you know, in in the in the older neural networks or in small batch sizes, you find most of the eigenvalues live in this bulk region, but there are these larger eigenvalues that pull out. Mm -hmm. And in, in larger neural networks, it, they're all it's all heavy tail. Gotcha. So what's going on here? So random matrix theory is, is a very is very interesting. This is the theory we use, and we're using some theory that is not really familiar in the machine learning literature. And sort of Michael pointed this out, that, you know, we did all this work in randomized linear algebra and sketching theory for building very, very high performance numerical systems, but nobody uses random matrix theory. In theoretical physics, we use random matrix theory all the time. Uh, it, it, it was invented by uh, Wigner, was the one who popularized it for the study of the spectra of nuclei. So random matrix theory says, if W is a simple random Gaussian matrix or a, a simple random matrix that's IID, and, and we're not entirely sure from theory what the conditions are on W. It could be random, as long as it's random and not too strongly correlated. Then we know that the spectral density will have a very simple form. The histogram of the eigenvalues, depending on this value of Q, which is this aspect ratio, basically the, is the matrix square or is it rectangular? You get a shape that looks, if Q is one, you get the sort of, you, the eigenvalues approach zero, but then they cut off around four. If Q is larger, say Q is four, you get a shape that looks sort of this, it cuts, you get a nice curve where the eigenvalues are all larger than zero and they fall around two. And when Q is, when the matrix is very, very rectangular, you get a nice crisp bulk like this. And so there, there are very important things that are going on here. One, the eigenvalues are always tightly bounded in a region. Two, the edge is very, very crisp. And we can say something about what the, the statistics look like at the edge. Uh, it also says something about what the distribution of the eigenvalues themselves look like in terms of their distances between them. Now, if you go back and look at um, our older model, if you go up here, for example, these Gaussian random matrices, they fit this red line exactly. And even if there are a few outliers, sometimes you get outliers, but the bulk of the problem always sort of fits random matrix theory quite well. But what we found, if we look at what we said is, well, you know, not only do we see this when we decrease the batch size, we got this idea, why don't we look at pre-trained neural networks? And it turns out nobody's ever done this in the literature. It turns out looking like we've looked, but there are hundreds of them. There are hundreds of pre-trained neural networks. And we can just go and look at the mm. eigenvalues of the rate matrices. We just download them and do it. 
So why don't we do Because that's what I do in industry. I don't, very rarely do I train my own neural network from scratch. Nobody will pay for that. You know, clients don't want to spend $50,000 training their own neural networks. They want to go download some free trained neural network and maybe fine tune it. So that's what we do. So it turns out that when W is heavy tailed, uh, um, it, it turns out that in, in random matrix theory, if W is heavy tailed, then the spectral density will have heavy tails. But that's not what we mean. What we mean here is that W is strongly correlated. And so this is an idea from physics, which is a, sort of an intuition from physics. And there actually isn't a lot of mathematical theory to show this. There's a little bit. There's a little bit of theory. If you go to um, Boschow's book on random matrix theory, he talks a little bit about this. Uh, there's a very famous physicist, um, uh, Boschow, and some of his um, co-workers, Sejo and Potters, who have pioneered a lot of this work. Uh, these guys are pretty smart. They own a hedge fund. So they use this stuff. We use it in finance to study um, correlation matrices of the stock market. And that's how I know about this stuff, because I used to be a quant at BlackRock. So it turns out that when W is strongly correlated, in other words, it picks up the correlation of the data, then you get these heavy tail distributions. And what we found is that if you do sort of an experiment where you look at all pre-trained neural networks, they all display heavy tails. They all, all there, there's very little bulk plus spike. So what we have sort of in the paper is what we describe is um, a phenomenological way of looking at the theory. We call it self-regularization, and we describe what are called the five plus one phases of training. And it's an idea that if you were to go and look at your weight mage, by the way, we wrote a tool called Weight Watcher. And so PIP install Weight Watcher, and Weight Watcher will actually compute all these graphs for you automatically. It automatically does the fit on, on, preach, on models from Keras or PyTorch. So... And the idea is that um, when you start off, you start off random like. As training begins, you start seeing this bleeding out. So you see these spikes appear. Notice that it's kind of a shelf that appears outside this, uh, what's called the Tracy Widom edge. Then you start getting real spikes that are separated from the edge. And this is called bulk plus spikes. So we have random like bleeding out bulk plus spikes. This model is called the spike covariance model. It was used, uh, it's very popular in statistics. Uh, there's a related model by a guy named Dieter Cerné, who is also a collaborator of Bouchard, and he calls this a model for, he used this model to describe um, um, a type of self-organization. So in physics, these are models that are used to describe self-organizing systems. Now that's sort of where we get the idea of self-regularization. Now it turns out no one's actually looked at heavy-tailed models. So as you include, as you get more and more spike, more and more correlations, not only do the spikes pull out. So here the spike is at three. Now it's at five, five, six. You start getting a decay of the bulk. Notice that the shape of the edge is different. Here you just have sort of random spikes. Here the edge is actually here the edge is concave. Here the edge is convex. So it's quite different. So it's, we think this is a different phenomenon. What you're seeing is the onset of a heavy tail. And then in, in very, very strong uh, correlated systems, it's fully heavy tail. And we also see cases where you get singularities, meaning you get zero eigenvalues in your weight matrices. So we actually see this in things like GANs or certain like the certain general adversarial networks will show that they, they, they're not trained as well. They're harder to train and they can have zero eigenvalues. So we call this the five plus one phases of training. And the idea is we present this as a way, a phenomenological way for people to look at their neural networks, to inspect the weight matrices and get some idea whether you're converging well. And this is for those of you who are sort of math geeks, um, this is the idea. Universality classes of random matrix theory. And I should be really careful about this. These universality classes have been pointed out by guys like Boucheau and Pesce, but this is very esoteric stuff, and there isn't a lot of research done on this. It's very, very thin in the literature. And even some of the stuff that we've done um, has really shown that people have not really flushed out the universality classes. Usually when people talk about random matrix theory, 99% of the people mean Gaussian random matrix theory. There's nothing very interesting. Another 1% to 5% will talk about the spiked covariance model. 
you have this sort of Gaussian in these low-rank perturbations. In other words, you have this. So, Amir pointed out that uh, this, by this, you mean five plus one. Five plus one. This, this, this. Each one of these curves, each, excuse me, each one of these plots corresponds, sort of intuitively corresponds to one of these universality classes. That's sort of the intuition. And we don't show the plus one because it's just, you know, you're just a singularity. So the idea is what we find, if you look at the, and the paper goes into in very, very great detail about what all this means mathematically. And it tells you about both the global shape and what happens at finite size. And, and the thing to realize is that a lot of people, when they do theoretical analysis of neural networks, you know, they're trying to use something like VC theory or something similar, but they also go to the infinite limit. And one of the things we know in, in physics is that finite size systems can look very different than the infinite size systems. This is a critical idea that comes through normalization group theory when you're looking at these kinds of distributions. Uh, this is actually described in detail in Sornay's book, which we cite in the, paper, in, the book, in the paper. But in particular, there's this universality class, which is heavy tailed, but where the exponent of the, of the, of the exponent of mu is really between two and four. And most people, when they talk about heavy tail, they mean mu is less than two. They're talking about levy processes with infinite mean. We're talking about systems which have finite mean and really finite variance because they're truncated, because they exist in this finite universality class. And so this is where we see most deep learning neural networks live. This is, um, and this is when we fit. Go ahead. Uh, Charles, um, I, I may want to. Um... I, it's a question about the, I think the previous slide, um, but I think it's a good one. Uh, so the question was, how do you decide when you have the best generalization based on five plus one? Ah, so we have a conjecture. And the conjecture is that you're going to generalize better when you're heavy tail. So if you fit, um, let me show you some experiments. I'll, I'll show you how this works. But the, the conjecture is that your exponents the exponent of your power law should be around two. So I'm, I'm gonna actually show this by actually looking at some pre-trained neural networks. So this is more detail, more technical stuff in the paper, which you can read about. It's very, very technical. Um, mm. But what we did now is we're gonna do something that nobody else in the field has done, amazingly. And we're actually gonna publish a paper on this, just this idea. We're gonna look at pre-trained neural networks. To do, so we're gonna do it like, what I used to be a chemist. So we do spectroscopy. You know, you take a molecule, you shine a laser on it, and you look at its eigenvalues. That's what spectroscopy is. Same thing. But we're going to look at hundreds of them. We've looked at over 450 pre-trained neural networks, and we have very, very general conclusions we can make. So we're going to start by looking at pre-trained models. We're going to look at the convolutional models. Lynette 5, we retrained Lynette 5 ourselves because we couldn't find it. But everyone else, AlexNet, Inception, ResNet, DinsNet, these are all widely available. You know, in PyTorch um, or Keras, and and there are, there's a GitHub repo which has hundreds of these, um, which has been uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of pre-trained models. When we started off, there were like maybe less than fifty pre-trained models. Now there are hundreds of them, probably at least seven hundred. So if you look at Lynette five, what you find is that you see this Marchenko pasture fit, and you see spikes. And if you compute something called the soft rank or the stable rank, it's around ten percent. So Lynette 5 appears to resemble bulk plus spikes. And I'm going to assume a lot of the people in the audience know, are familiar with, our deep learning guys may be familiar with Lynette 5, but this is the first neural network that was developed by Lee Kun back when I was a grad student. And it's just a, and it's very small. It's just a convolutional 2D layer, max pool, convidu, max pool, fully connected, fully connected. So it's a very classic architecture. With, I, I and what the, we're looking Lynette at. Uh, uh, sorry to interrupt. I think the Lynette, um, if I'm not mistaken, the first version of it was uh, the one that was patented as uh, Bill Labs, was it? Um, yes. Uh, like, he couldn't publish it for quite for quite a while. Yeah, it's pretty, this stuff's been around a long time. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think the uh, one of the biggest significance of it was that uh, the introduction of, of convolution neural nets, at, as you hinted before. Yes, yes. So yeah. if you look at AlexNet, and AlexNet is a similar architecture, but it's bigger. And it's, it's, you know, it has some other tweaks that they use to train it. But it still has a similar architecture, convolutional max pool, convolutional max pool, fully connected, fully connected. 
And you look at the fully connected wires. And we do that because they're bigger as so we get better estimates of the power walls. Look at this. Fully connected FC1 of AlexNet. You do the Marchico pressure fit. You see this tail coming in. Um, it almost looks like a good fit, but it looks like bulk decay. So because the, the you see this, uh, it's certainly not bulk plus spikes. Look at FC2 when you zoom in. It's a terrible fit. You can't get a good fit. The bulk region is just not filled in. And the power lex, when it goes up, uh, you, you still get this tail. Mm. So where is this? Is this, are we here, bulk decay, or are we heavy tail? We're in this region right here. Look at Inception. It turns out Inception actually has two um, fully connected layers. There's one in the middle. And if you look at it, it's very strange. It's actually bimodal. So we don't even know how to fit it to Marchico Pasteur. I mean, it has this sort of, it, what does it mean when you sort of fit here and then this little extra bump out here? What is that? We're not sure. But clearly it's not random matrix theory. A random matrix theory would say that the bulk would fill in and that there would be nothing. And so this is an interesting case where we have this sort of multimodal behavior. We see this, a lot of this even stronger behavior in general adversarial networks. So this is sort of this funny intermediate layer that's inside Inception that they use to improve the trading. Because they have sort of this two losses and they add them together by sort of, it's kind of like a funny residual connection that they put in. Didn't, um, Charles, didn't your um, phase five plus one um, also elicit some of that bimodality? Um, well, it's kind of this, right? Yeah, a, a little bit of a... Right. And then there is a yeah. gap. Yeah. I think there's a gap. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. Um, let me, I already interrupted you. Let me ask another question that was please, asked please. By, the, uh, by the audience. Um, uh, they were asking about the uh, intuition uh, behind uh, the GAN singularity, and if and if you're and, and if, if if this can help uh, elaborate a little bit. Well, I, I just think that the, you need a better regularizer. I mean, GANs now are using regularizers that have um, uh, that try to prevent the eigenvalue collapse. Mm -hmm. So you have to put that in. But we, when you look at the GANs, they look crazy. I mean, some of the layers look crazy. Like you have you have like you'll see one that I don't think we have it in this talk because it's more recent work, but you see like double spikes. So you like, so you see like a lot, I, th I think basically the GANs are just not well architected, it's difficult to architect them. And what we expect you would want to see if you look inside the eigenvalue layers, you want to see something like this, this nice smooth layer. You want to see, you want to see this. And sometimes you see like there's a spike and then there's another spike. There's like two of them. Only the GANs show this. And we think it's mm -hmm. like some exhibiting some weird kind of rent collapse. But that's something we could talk about a little. It's Got later it. research we've done. We could just we could talk about it offline also if you want. But that's basically Absolutely. the idea is we want you want all your weight matrices to look like this. And when they don't look like this, you're not there. You just you're not you're not good enough. So Got it. this is an example of where um you've got to be careful also because remember you have to have Q greater than one. So here you see this sort of rent collapse where all the eigenvalues are greater than a, than a certain, are, are too small. You know, the eigenvalue should be greater than zero. And when you see this rank collapse, what we have a conjecture is that DNN should not lose hard rank. They, they lose soft rank, soft rank or stable rank, um, which is, we described that in the paper. That's basically the Frobenius norm divided by the maximum eigenvalue, the, the spectral norm. But we have a conjecture that no good neural network should lose hard rank. You shouldn't see zero eigenvalues. Now, in theoretically, we can describe this idea of bulk plus spikes. Um, and this is described in the paper using perturbation theory. Um, I won't go into that. But th this idea that we go back to taking off regularization. When you have bulk plus spikes, there's a scale cutoff for the eigenvalues. And so the scale cutoff for the eigenvalue of this, where the bulk region cuts off, is similar in spirit to the scale cutoff that occurs in taking off regularization. And this is what we mean by old models like Lynette Vive sort of exhibit a type of self-regularization, but it looks like traditional regularization. There's a scale cutoff. Mm. All large neural networks are scale-free. 
they all exhibit this heavy tail behavior, and we don't believe there's a, a, a really good scale cutoff on the eigenvalues, meaning that if you try to throw away these eigenvalues, you're going to lose performance. Now, you, you, you could try to throw them away because you're trying to, you know, distill the network or compress it. And people want to do that. You know, they want to compress these neural networks. And we're concerned about, you know, you, and, and even Michael, my collaborator, developed a method called Qbert, which is quantized BERT, uh, where they quantize based on the eigenvalues of the Hesky. But, yep. you know, we, we definitely don't think that, you know, that if you cut off these eigenvalues, you're going to get a loss of performance. So you can't just naively throw them away the way you would in, say, truncated SVD or taking off regularization. Now we're going to look at this, this idea of universality. I told you that we were looking at parallel exponents. When I wrote this paper, we looked at at least 10,000 weight matrices. We've actually looked at um, probably 50,000 to 100,000 by now, because going across every weight matrix and feature map and every pre-trained neural network we can find. If you look at image net models and you just look at the um, fully connected layers, for example, and you plot a histogram of how you can fit the spectral density to a power law. So we take all these different models, we fit the weight matrix spectral density to a power law alpha for every weight, for every layer in the, every fully connected layer. And we make a histogram plot. And we find that most of the exponents alpha lie between two and four, and there are a couple outliers. If we do it for the Allen and LP models, uh, back then, Allen NLP was more, you know, we didn't have all the BERT and GP2 and ELMO. So Allen NLP was what we had. Uh, and if you do the plot, you see a, a more outliers. But definitely most of the eigenvalues, uh, excuse me, the spectral densities can be fit to parallel exponents between 2 and 4. And so they display this sort of remarkable universe. I call it universality in the sense that way Dino Cernay would describe universality, not in the sense that you know, a, a hardcore theoretical physics would call it. The, the universality meaning that the exponents all seem to concentrate. If you make a larger plot, and now we extract out the convolutional 2D feature maps, and we plot, and we fit all the feature maps to a parallel exponent, and we look, 80 to 90% of all of your feature maps and your fully connected layers have parallel exponents near two. So this is sort of they concentrate around two empirically. Obviously, there are going to be lots of outliers because this is you know uh, uh, an empirical study, but this is what we see. So uh, we so Charles, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, no, please. Two points. Uh, one, uh, we have around twelve minutes um, uh, total. Uh, the other, if you don't mind, uh, there's a question about uh, like the previous point that you mentioned. Um, okay. And I think it's a good one. Uh, so what does it say um, about initialization? Can we can you start from heavy tail distribution to shorten the training time? No, no. This is a very important thing that we that you have to realize what's going on. Um, when we say that W is, we're not saying that W is heavy tail. Okay, we're saying that X is heavy tail. X is heavy tail. So X is the correlation matrix of W. Mm -hmm. So when, to say if W were heavy tailed, that would mean that it has some one large element. If W were heavy tailed, we'd expect, now maybe there's a way of coming up with a heavy tailed guess, but the idea is that it's not random. So when people talk about extreme value theory, and they apply extreme value theory, which we do in some of our papers. We mean the idea that W has a large element, one large element, and that one large element dominates the eigenvalue spectrum. What we're saying is W does not have one large element, but it's strongly correlated. So we're not saying, so this is a very important point to realize, uh, because the, the notion of, of, of random matrix theory says you can have many, many distributions with the same correlation structure many, many different Ws that lead to the same uh, alpha. So saying something about alpha doesn't necessarily tell you specifically what's W. It just says many, many Ws can give the same alpha. So a heavy tail W can give an alpha and a correlated W can also give an alpha with the same exponent. Hmm. Makes sense, thank you. You got it. So one of the things we do is, and here are some more examples. Here's Bert, for example. I don't have, um, 
what I can tell you is that there's a conjecture we had is that smaller exponents lead to better generalization. And this is a conjecture we made based on just empirical experiments. By the way, this is an example of rank collapse. So in rank collapse, you see almost no good models have zero eigenvalues. We have like, you know, a few zero eigenvalues in the image net. Almost no good neural networks have zero eigenvalues. So we don't see rank collapse. So in BERT, the original BERT model actually had quite a few large exponents. Now it turns out if you compared, we don't have it in this presentation. This is, this is I, I, if you compare like say GP2 to GP1, and you know that um, OpenAI just released their big GP2 version like yesterday, right? GPT2 and GPT1. Yeah. GPT21, right? If you look at GPT2, its exponents are actually smaller. They actually, they're actually, they don't have as many outliers, and the average parallel exponent is actually smaller. So I think we have this in one of our papers. Uh, but this is so if you do this yourself and you look, this is so the old BERT sort of looked like this. The newer BERT doesn't have as many of these outliers, and the average is to the left. Hmm. So we had a conjecture that. Smaller exponent means better generalization. So I decided to try then another crazy idea, which nobody's ever done. Can we predict the test accuracy without looking at the test data? I mean, isn't that the point of theory to predict the test accuracy without, I mean, you're supposed to be able to get a bound on the test accuracy. So can we predict trends in the test accuracy? Mm -hmm. So the theory doesn't say anything about this. So the yeah. idea well, I'm going to do is just, I'm just going to kind of be a kind of a dumb experimentalist, a dumb chemist, and I'm not a good physicist, and I'm just going to measure a bunch of crazy stuff. So we have a theory for why this might work, but I want to show you the plot. If we look at the average Frobenius norm of all the, of a bunch of pre-trained neural networks, so we look at the Frobenius, and there's there's some good theoretical reasons to look at the Frobenius norm. Uh, Michael says it's the, I, I say it comes from some of the areas of quantum field theory and, and, and statistical mechanics that show you this. And I'll write a blog post on that, but this is related to some of this work on these infinitely wide networks. Um, but basically the Frobenius norm is not a bad measure of your capacity. And if you plot the average of the log Frobenius norm versus your test accuracy, and you do this for a bunch of pre-trained neural networks, like VG11, 13, 16, 19, in the same architecture series, you see that the average log norm actually is correlated with the test accuracy. Mm -hmm. So no one's ever pointed this out. That, I mean, ne no negatively, reason. of course. Well, ne yeah, the, small, the smaller the norm, the small, because I mean, if you do L2 regularization, you have smaller norms. So the smaller the norm, the better the test accuracy. Mm -hmm. So it turns out, we do a little math. I do a little math. It's derive an expression from that to get an expression called um, uh, a parallel, a norm parallel relation, where I can show that um, the log of the Frobenius norm is uh, for heavy tailed matrices is actually approximately equal to alpha times the log lambda max. So I have a derivation of this where I, I do a little, I do a little, um, kind of close my eyes and use a little um, extreme value theory to do this. I can also derive this using some ideas from quantum field theory and statistical mechanics. I'm very close now. I'm off by one, but it's very similar. But the idea is that the Frobenius norm actually looks like alpha times the spectral norm. And so it turns out that alpha, this object here, is typically called the stable rank or the soft rank. And so our alpha is like the stable rank or the soft rank, but in the log units. And so I think there's a guy at Princeton who claims theoretically that, well, you know, when the soft rank gets smaller, you get better generalization. So we have sort of a similar result. But we also see in, in our case, this relation holds very, very well for very, for when W is heavy tailed for alpha less than two. And it turns out it's not bad when alpha is between two and four. Now, these are simulations of heavy tailed W, not correlated W. But it appears that there's a universal linear power law relation, and we sort of show this numerically. And now we're going to use it. So, I, uh, so what we do is we're going to compute the average log alpha, where we take for each weight matrix, we compute the alpha, and we compute the maximum eigenvalue of that weight matrix. And we do an average over all the, all the feature maps and all the layers. 
So we're going to compute this thing called the weighted alpha metric, which is kind of like an, uh, which is related to the average log for Venus storm. And we get a nice plot and it's even better. And you see that the test accuracy, so again, smaller alpha, better test accuracy. Now remember, we're not looking at the test data. I don't have the test data. I'm not an academic. I don't have access to, you know, I, I, I don't have any of the test data. All I'm doing is downloading the pre-trained models from Keras and PyTorch and making these plots. Works for ResNet. If you do it for ResNet, you get nice trends where you see a trend that as the top one error goes down, the average alpha goes down. And notice it's minus one because we're taking the log of the maximum eigenvalue and the, the eigenvalue is smaller than one, so we get a minus. But you see this trend. We have studied this for over 450 pre-trained models. And 90% of the time you see these very nice trends. And we've also can show that our metric works systematically better than other metrics. And we have a, a Google Colab notebook, which you can actually download our Weight Watcher tool and you can run the Google Colab network. It actually takes more than 12 hours to run because we do it on hundreds of models. But you can, you can actually reproduce all these results yourself exactly. So how would you do it yourself? Well, you uh, pip install Weight Watcher. It, there's a PyPy we just released version 0.2. Uh, a couple days ago, I think I need to do a, a, a minor update to 0 0.21, so um, expect that. But you can install PIP, you can install Weight Watcher. You just stick your model in. I go. You download the model from Keras or PyTorch. You stick it in. You say analyze. You get your results and you print them. And we have a web page where we describe the Weight Watcher tool, many of our online talks, papers, and so. You know, the goal here is not only to show that we can make these kind of, we understand why regularization works. We have this sort of new theory, which we relate um, back to some of the things people are doing, both as this mechanics, but also machine learning. But we also built a tool. So the work is 100% reproducible. It's reproducible. Uh, and if you can't reproduce it, come to us and we'll, find, we'll fix the bug in the tool. It's reproducible. And it allows you to look at pre-trained neural networks. It allows you to look at scale to do experiments. You know, J J Jeremy Howard says, you guys know Jeremy Howard from past, he says, you know, people try to do physics experiments and you can't publish them. Because deep learning people don't like doing experiments. But, you know, we, I sort of take the vein that he has, <laughs> you know, we want to do practical things. Um, well, yes. You may be, you may be a tiny bit over generalizing over there, but, but. So, so I, I, I'd like to um, use that opportunity to jump in and say, well, I think our audience is just fascinated with this. Um, and, I, and I think this is the kind of work that we need. Now, the focus mostly in, in neural networks these days is to just design a new architecture um, and, and make, uh, you know, address a, a bigger task. Uh, yes. Multitask yes. learning is, 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 is you know, the focus of these days and curriculum learning also. So. Moving towards AGI, if I may, may even dare claim that. But uh, but this type of work, why isn't why is more collapse happening? Um, right. Like, this is the thing that we need to know. Uh, now now pe people in computer science may have uh, you know a, or, or at, at points in time uh, people's attention uh, for 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 better or worse happens to focus on one thing and we stick with it forever until we exhaust it and we realize that there are other things that matter. The same thing happened actually to neural networks um, you know, for, for, for a few decades. Anyhow, just wanted to, <laughs> to yeah, mention that. Like, you know, we, I'm doing this on my, I, I do freelance consulting. So I'm doing this on my own. And I always tell Michael, look, I'm not an academic, so I don't have funding. This has been funded through my work with Anthropocene Institute and the Page family funded me to do this. And, um, you know, and my, they didn't fund me to do this. They funded my other work, and I was able to do this on the side. And and the point is that, um, you know, when you talk to people, they go, well, all we want is a regularizer. Just give us a new regularizer. Like, look, guys, the, the point is that a regularizer has to be simple and differentiable. So you use the L2 norm, or you can use the soft rank, right? You could mm -hmm. use... You know, you could use this as the regularizer because you could compute the maximum eigenvalue with like three steps of the power method. So you can use this as a regularizer. The point is to not do that. You know, if you don't, if you say, I'm not going to build a regularizer, I want to look at the detailed structure. Now, we gave it this, uh, we gave this tool to some people at one of the big uh, uh, companies out here. I won't say where, but pretty big. And the first thing you tried to do is build a regularizer out of SVD. Go, 
what are you doing? You know, you, you, you just, <laughs> the point of this is that if you want to regularize, regularize. That's fine. Well, you can do soft rank regularization plus try to avoid the, um, you, you would do soft rank plus spectral norm plus um, uh, rank collapse regularization. So you would need to implement three different regularizers to make this work and, and try to tune them. And that's fine. I think it's great. Our goal is to try to understand more broadly and globally what's going on. And I sort of have this crazy idea that you should be able to predict at least trends in the accuracy of your neural network architectures without looking at the data. Th think about how you build a bridge. Mm -hmm. You build a bridge. How do you test a bridge in the real world? Do you just drive cars and trucks over and over and over until it falls down? No, it's a, what are you doing? You know, I mean, they have a theory, right? In fact, singular value decomposition was used to develop the theory of bridges to keep them from. So it's the same thing when you go and you're building a self-driving car. Yeah. What do you have? Infinite test data? It, it costs I mean, it, it, even, yeah, even if you do that experimentally, you may or may not be able to show why such is happening. Why is it that the bridge is falling apart? Well, I, I, well, right. And, and if you're testing a self-driving car, how much data do you buy? You know, you need to have a way of analyzing your neural network to figure out how well it's going to perform without having to spend $50 million on test data. Uh, you know, and, and literally 12, 10 million, mm -hmm. literally, you're looking at, you know, average, mm -hmm. I mean, you talked to a friend of mine who's a PM here. He says he spends between, you know, 5 and $12 per label. Mm -hmm. Think about that. So you're yeah. talking about, you know, you need a way to, you should be able to use theory to look at your deep neural network, to look at class, you know, trends, you know, different architectures and make systematic predictions about how the system will perform yeah. without having to spend $50 million. And, and that's sort of the, 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 the intent of this. And this is just sort of scratching the surface yeah. of what can be done. Remember, we're not yeah. using the, you know, we could actually also use the training data. You can input the training data and try to build, but we're just looking at the, at just the weight matrices themselves. Yeah. Um, I argue, well, I, I loved it, um, Charles. Um, I, I think this is amazing. And I think this is, I, I argue that this is the most important most, I don't, I mean, I mean, as, as much as I'm interested to see more architectures, but this is the most important part um, that we currently we need in deep learning. It, this has come up in, in, in many ways as to how we should approach this, uh, both from the explainability side of things. So people are I'm talk a lot about ethics of AI, um, and, and, but underneath, um, if it's if it's not backed by theory, then then that that that, that talk doesn't get get um, you know anywhere. Um, you know what, what we like to say is we're not we're not writing theorems we're building a theory mm -hmm. we want the theory to work when you have electromagnetics you have maxwell's equations it's not a bunch of papers with mathematical theorems it's a theory mm -hmm. that people use to build radios you know and dvs and you know satellites yeah. it's a theory when you do quantum computing you have quantum mechanics it's a it's not about a bunch of papers about yeah. quantum it's about building it's about making so it's the same thing for us we're trying to build a theory and we start by doing experiments. Once we have the experimental data, then we start building advanced mathematics to try to extend and make predictions. Um, absolutely. So let me, in the interest of time, we got one minute left, but um, we got a couple of questions and would like to also uh, very briefly summarize the entire um, talk to maybe two or three bullet points. Uh, let's, gotcha. let's do that first and then we go to the question. So what I want to summarize is that we, we, we have this sort of theory of, we call it the five plus one phases of training, and it allows you to analyze, the core, analyze your neural networks and to give some in insight into what your weight, what, how your convergence is performing, how you're going to generalize based on just looking at the weight matrices themselves. And we believe that Smaller alpha is better. You can fit your weight matrices to a parallel exponent, and the smaller the alpha, the better test accuracy you should see, which corresponds to the five plus one phases of training. The more heavy tailed you are, the better you do. And we wrote a tool called Weight Watcher that you can install and run to do this for you. 
Uh, we even have a Slack channel for the tool if you want to get on and ask questions and be involved more deeply in the research. And uh, we know we're, we know we'll hit it big when um, we get the cease and desist order from Weight Watchers. But for now, we're just getting started. We're really happy to have people download the tool, use it, ask questions, um, and get whatever feedback we can. Absolutely. Beautiful. Thanks very much. Uh, let's go through uh, questions uh, very quickly. If, if, you, if you have time, I'm not sure. It's already one. Uh, of course I have time. Whatever, whatever you guys need. Okay, beautiful. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll try to be brief in, in, in the answers, please. Um, so uh, I, one was asked a little bit earlier on, but it was parallel, so I, I deferred it um, to, um, to a later point, which is now. Um, it was asked, how about using a distribution exponent as a loss metric? Um, in the training loop, um, or not loss metric, but a diagnostic guide during training? Well, I mean, it, look, these are, you're running SVD calculations, and then you have to do a fit. So it's slow. Uh, now, if your Epox take five hours, I have models where five hours per Epox is normal, then, you know, popping this out at the end of the Epox is fine. Um, and measuring it. And, you know, we haven't actually built this as a plug in the TensorBoard. But we'd be happy. We'd love to have some people help and make a plug in the TensorFlow. You know, we're doing this all in our spare time. The um, in terms of making it as part of the loss function, again, um, it has to be differentiable, and SVD is highly nonlinear. So how mm -hmm. do you make it differentiable? So mm -hmm. if you want to make it differentiable, you know, use the soft rack because this is this is easily differentiable. The computer. This is like spectral norm regularization. But you know, to, to, to do the spectral, to, to, to do the SVD, and then to do the power law fit, which is an MLE estimator of the SVD, that's very complicated. And probably what you would want to do is do something like a cumulant expansion. You know, if you really wanted to work it out, you'd have to do something like a higher order cumulant expansion uh, of your distribution and, and try to figure out a way to compute that directly without having to do SVD. And that's, that's non trivial. That's a that's the kind of stuff we did like in quantum chemistry. So it takes a lot of work. But um, so I would say TensorBoard plugin. That's all I would do it. Amazing. Well, thank you very much. In the interest of time, um, uh, we would like to um, say goodbye to our audience. But thank you very much, Charles. I loved it. Uh, I'm sure they love it. Uh, we'll reach out if you if you don't mind. Can people reach out to you um, for any further questions? Absolutely. Okay. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. Hey, thank, uh, thank you. you for I really appreciate it. Yeah, All right. absolutely. All right. All right. Have a great day, everybody. You too.